A contract, a marriage contract. Let's talk about how you determine whether you're married and what you do when you're married and how you live and grow according to a contract or a vow that you make. Okay, first off, anybody that finds somebody and says to the other person, I want to marry you, and the other person says, okay, I want to marry you, they can call themselves married all they want. <clears throat> the government can give them special tax breaks. They can view them as a married couple. It really doesn't matter. If animals could talk, they could do the same thing. It really doesn't matter. What the marriage that I'm talking about is all about is when two people come together in the concept of what they believe the Creator wanted from marriage and how they believe the Creator designed for them to live and to be as one in marriage. <clears throat> now, every religion probably has a different way of looking at it, and the way you determine what your vows are going to be and how you're going to vow to one another and who you're going to who you're going to serve in the marriage, who you're who you're demonstrating this for, beyond yourself, a creator, um, an idea of you know the perfect way that that people are supposed to be together, that kind of thing, is all about the vows that you make and what they mean. Now. I'm just going to use my marriage as an example because I'm most familiar with that and it's something that is very similar to many of the vows that regular people that practice a Christian religion uh, would probably do. So I'm going to go with that and that's what the purposes of this is. Now first off, if you get married in the truest sense, the way I'm going to describe it, you can't get unmarried, you can't get divorced. Because um, you're committed to that person, you're becoming one flesh. If you did get divorced, you'd still be married. You'd you'd still be the one flesh because you committed to that. Okay, what we did was we said, okay, we're going to come together and we're going to grow, and we're going to adapt a set of outline rules that are the vows are going to specify, and we're going to live by those. <clears throat> if you change your mind later on part of the vow is that you can't change your mind later on. You I mean, sure, you can go and live on your own, you can do whatever you want, but you really still can't do it, even though you're doing it. So, <clears throat> what we decided to do, because we came together from a Catholic background and a Protestant background, I don't even know what kind of background it was, my wife was Catholic, I was really wasn't it anything that I knew of what what it was I couldn't even describe it um, um, my my parents were in a Presbyterian church and before that we were in a Baptist church but I really didn't I hadn't become a man at that point and I didn't know what uh, what a church was I didn't know uh, what my feelings were on it I, you know I kind of got married right after I became you know independent so it took us a while to sort this out afterwards but we knew right when we got married, as basically as kids still, that we needed a foundation we could stand on that would surpass us once we had gotten to understand what we were doing later on. I guess kind of like the Founding Fathers. They had to set up this country and this constitution and, and everything and have it foresee unknown circumstances in the future. Well, we had to do that with our marriage. So what we said was, that we were going to commit to one another to do something that was a little bit different than what we understood that a lot of people's marriages are. And that is that we would not have the husband be the head of the wife because we were going to commit to Jesus' teachings only. Now, in the Gospels, everything that Jesus taught through the living word, through the parables, through his description of kingdom of heaven everything he's he's talked about we're going to live according to that non-judgment everything being equal now when you get into past the gospels you get into people saying things like the man is the head of the house the head of the household the head of the family um and it's defined like that whenever you start talking about things like that that are away from Jesus' teachings it could be argued that that structure 
from those beginning people was still a part of the structure of the chosen people of the old covenant and because it could be argued that way I'm not saying I'm going to throw it out but we're not going to live it that way because we vowed to live according to Jesus' teachings so it's really kind of difficult to say okay I'm not going to go and take from the rest of the things that go on but when Jesus was on the cross he said to Peter that I'm going to build my church on this rock and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven and I see this as being the power given to the church now what is the church there's churches all over the world there's churches of all religions there's churches of all denominations but if we take what Jesus is teaching say the church are Jesus says when two or more are gathered in his name that there is love and he says that because of that and you're following my ways you'll know me if we are doing that and there's love then we're gathered in his name two of us we can have that power of the church because when he was crucified the temple tor curtain was torn in two and what that signifies is that the chosen people in the old covenant could not go into there only certain people only certain priests that did everything just proper the way, the way Jesus the way God said so because Jesus wasn't there yet only those people could go through there now upon the crucifixion the temple curtain was torn in two this means your standard person could enter into the holiest of holies in that temple this is a significant thing because this shows the difference between the separation even though there was united God with the chosen people it they had to be God's purpose had to be relayed through a priest or a person to the people outside that curtain outside the temple the law had to be shown and written for them and what God wants had to be shown when Jesus came along and he was crucified and he had done his work the temple curtain was torn you common person could go in there any person could go in there it's just symbolic but in other words it's not veiled anymore so this almost gives a person the value of a priest because we have direct communion with God now through his son and through the Holy Spirit so when you have a man that has this and you have a woman that has this and they're believers and they come together in marriage in Jesus' name it's like they're both priests when they come together and there's love that's like a church so they can loose on earth and loose in heaven they can bind on earth and bind in heaven this most important concept makes them become one flesh and their decisions of what they do to do that loosing and binding will help them as they govern their way through the world through the onslaughts of the things that would come to them their own valley of the shadow of death so to speak and how they go through that with forgiveness for one another and from Jesus and for the cause of the Creator so they make up their composition of a marriage and they do that and they go through the world that way in their life for as long as it may be as that one flesh with that loosing and binding as a church now they can gather with other believers if they want to they can attend what's called a formalized church if they want to but they can be seen as a church in and of itself so that marriage can't be broken apart because if the break it, if it was broken apart the church would be broken apart you could separate those two people and you could go all different places of the earth they could say I don't love you anymore they could say you know I want to do my own thing I was you know what but if that if they did that they wouldn't have done what they said they were doing in the first place so God said to the chosen people I will allow you to divorce because your heart is becoming hardened when this happened 
it was it was acceptable, but it wasn't the best thing. It wasn't right because how does your heart harden when you've been given everything that you've been promised and you've been righteous and re- in return you've been given long life and prosperity and lands and wealth and everything you need by God, but yet you still wanted to get a divorce. Did you not have enough faith? Did you fall out of righteousness? What did you do when everything was right in front of you that showed that God was there for you? How did your heart harden? Why did you want that divorce? Some phenomenon occurred that should never have occurred with the way it was set up. But this isn't what we are now. Why would we get divorced now? Our heart's not going to harden. The Holy Spirit is upon us. We're going Jesus' way. We're following the teachings of Jesus to describe to one another who we are, what we're to do, and what we do together. And Our heart's not going to harden. If it did, we'd have to say to ourselves, well then, the Holy Spirit doesn't exist. Jesus' teachings don't work. Jesus' work was in vain. So, because we're not having our hearts hardened in this new covenant, we don't have a way to divorce. If we were to divorce, what that really means is we just weren't married in the first place. We just thought we were. We weren't qualified to be that church. We weren't qualified to be a believer and come together as one flesh and be a believer. We weren't qualified for that. So, therefore, we didn't have the power to loose and bind. We didn't have the power to enter the temple. We didn't have the power to be priests. We didn't have the power to do any of that. And so because we weren't married, we could be divorced because we weren't married. So this assumes that we were married. This video assumes that we are married. I'm talking about people that are married, did choose to leave and cleave and become one flesh, follow Jesus' teachings, become as priests, become as a church, be able to loose and bind, and forge their way through the life. That can't be separated. If it's genuine and real, it can't be separated. So then the question is, well, how much efficiency do you have without loosing and binding? How well did you select what should be loose and bound? Maybe you said, we could have been freer, but let's burden ourselves by thinking in these restrictions. We could have had this but let's run after this and sidetrack ourselves and get lost in the things that are of less importance in this world. So what do we do? We're loosing, we're, we're binding ourselves, aren't we? We're saying, oh shoot, I'm going to trip on this. I'm going to allow myself to trip on this. I've got a vice. I'm going to go do this. We're binding ourselves. And to the degree that we bind one another by our inability to get past that, we hinder the other person from becoming all they can be. But we do that together. We're bound. We cannot be what we were supposed to be because we made that problem for ourselves. And so we're binding ourselves with less. We're allowing our ultimate goal or our heightened conscience or our understanding of what God wants from us, what the Creator intended, to be not as high as it should be. But if we loose and we say, why do people think they can't do this? Why do people think they shouldn't do this? The reason why we'll find that a lot of times they think they shouldn't do those things is because it'll trip them up. But a lot of times we make our own binds and we trip ourselves up. Let's look at something. If we're God's children, if we're favored, if we truly how have God's face shine upon us and our church and our, our together we're blessed we have the Holy Spirit if it's true and real we can do as we need because our faith is on our faith our faith is on Jesus our perpetual state of prayer is bound with what Jesus wants in his teachings and so therefore what we put our hearts and minds to is of that goodness so whatever we do if we're doing that, is of that goodness. That's a loosening. We can loosen something. Say, I can't provide for my family unless I do internet, computer software, agreements, all these things. I won't make it. So do I owe these large companies 
that serve money, the root of all evil, to, to educate myself and take my time away from my family and my life and become a legal understanding ability to know what all those things are and all those contracts? I heard someone say it would take 21 days a year for the common person to read everything that they agree to. But let's say I read it all. I might not even understand it. How far do I have to go to the ends of the earth to say, yes, I agree to something, a service contract of some kind? I may never understand all the concepts and all the ins and outs and what have yous and the snares and traps. But if I did do it, I would be saying... I agree with whatever you say because you're serving money and I'm, I'm sure that's fine. And, I'm, and in order for me to live, I've got to use your large thing that you've made, your corporate thing that you've made in order to, to, to get money to put on the table and things like that. What you're basically doing is you're elevating those that would do something for the name of money with more than the money. You're letting your word be yes. You're letting your, uh, your yes be yes, your, your, your no be no. And you're giving them a vow you're giving them a vow of how much greater they are than just the money of the thing you buy. So I believe that one of the greatest concepts that we can see as a loosening is the inability to feel bound by that. The loosening of the ability to feel as though we have to raise them up higher than just the giving them of more money for the thing in the first place. When we know we're already doing unto others, as we'd want done unto us. And so we're not going to abuse their thing. We're not going to try to rip them off or try to mess up their terms or whatever. But we know that Jesus said to the Pharisees and Sadducees that you have made so many rules and become so litigious that even you couldn't live by them. So that's a that's an understanding of loosening. We give each other the freedom to say, I'm not going to become a lawyer so that I can understand these legal things. We're just going to click the button. Does that mean our yes is not yes and our no is not no? No, we didn't value them high enough to see that as anything more than a button. We didn't value them high enough to think we're going to recompartmentalize and shift around our whole life so that we'll fit whatever they think the bill is that has to go along with the usage of their thing. And, and I'm talking about every type of thing that you can possibly think of to sign. We're living in a world now where, quite frankly, uh, if you look at Re Revelation, if you, you, if you couldn't have it without signing it, it'd be almost the equivalent of taking the mark of the beast. If you couldn't gain the ability to live with these modern tools and the ability to eat because you have the food or the credit card companies or whatever, PayPal, whatever it is, you're already doing something that in time the mark of the beast will not allow you to do. But for right now, you can make an argument when maybe you are already signing the, you know, signing the mark of the beast. You know, that's one thing that concerns me. And being in a perpetual state of prayer, I think about that a lot. By the fact that I have to live in a world where I wouldn't have lived otherwise, other than being a minimum wage migrant worker in the fields, among maybe other undocumented type people in maybe different countries, flee to another area just to survive. It, it, it has revelation all written all over it. So in our marriage, we loose and we bind. We say we must govern ourselves. We need a certain sense of discipline. We need a certain sense of discipline for our children and our family. We're binding. That's got to be done. If it isn't, we're going to be not responsible and answerable to the higher calling that we are meant to be in conscious understanding of service of God through Jesus' teachings. We loosen ourselves so that we can exist in the first place, so that we can have the freedom to do what we do. What we follow Jesus' teachings and we say, this is what we see. We share them with one another, and that helps us in our marriage. As we study what the teachings mean in the living word, and that wells up within us, we offer that to one another, and that continually renews. If that does not renew, and it's not happening, then the vow that we chose to live by wasn't truly made. And we wouldn't need to get divorced because we weren't truly married. Even if one of us thinks we were and does that vow, if the other one doesn't, that would be desertion or not desertion because you never signed on. These concepts are heavy.
my wife asked me to do this after 27 years so we can re-examine things more deeply and be on the same page about things, so I'm doing this. But I'm doing this for other people as well, in a generic sense, so that they can see, if they're married as a Christ follower, what that means, what kind of powers and restrictions, loosing and binding, do you have as a real church, just in the two of you, with Jesus at the helm? Have you thought about these things? Do formalized churches talk about them? I've been to many formalized churches and I've not heard anybody talk about these things in this way. One of the reasons why I do conscious counseling and I offer these things to others that would listen and are looking for these things is because where else would you find them? Yes, there are in Jesus' words. Yes, you can find them there. But most people call man father and find what Jesus says. And a lot of times the father and the formalized church Things get corrupted so that a certain way of seeing things has to be done in order for you to say, I'm a part of this group. And what does that serve mostly? It serves your indoctrination into a system that is also entrenched with monetary need. Service of money, root of all evil. In order to be on that rock that Jesus built his church on, we need to see what that rock's made of. And that rock's made of, not made of a huge collect, a collective, a huge pope, a huge conglomerate of some kind of something or other that get together oh there must be proof because look at all those people they can't all be wrong no the rock is an infinitely small thing that every two can have simply and that's what marriage is